Well, um, welcome to the, uh, the Get Lucky Now Masterclass. We call it the Masterclass because rather than me um, just feeling like a teacher or a lecturer just talking the whole time, I prefer to work with real people with real life issues. And the thing that we all share is that uh, we all feel that um, th there's a better version of us hiding somewhere and, and uh, using a few of uh, the tips and techniques that have stood the test of time, many of them, thousands of years, some of them. That's what the show, that's what the Masterclass is about. It's for me to share some of the things that I uh, have, have been very helpful to me personally and with the clients that I work with, and also for the guests on the show to enlighten us on some of the stuff that they get up to. So it's a, a two-way exchange. Uh, so James has, uh, I beg your pardon, Stephen has uh, um, kindly agreed to help me with this masterclass. And so um, welcome, Stephen. I think you're, uh, you're, you're based in Cyprus. So we're a few uh, hundreds of miles away from each other, a thousand maybe. Um, if, if you're in UK, then it's 2000. If you're in Portugal, I think it's maybe slightly more. 2,000 miles. I'm in UK at the moment. <laughs> um, so, James, uh, I, I'm, just, I'm sorry if I keep calling you uh, James, because there's another James that uh, we're waiting, uh, waiting for as well. No so, problem. Um, so, may I ask you, what, what, what do you do for a living? What, uh, what do you find in Cyprus appealing, apart from the sunshine, no doubt? Um, well, I actually am a sort of marketing, a stroke booking agent for holiday villas in Cyprus. Okay, and, and uh, how long have you lived in Cyprus for? Um, on and off for about 15 years. Okay, good. And when you're, uh, I imagine this time of year, particularly with the whole world coming out of COVID, is going to be quite busy for, for you. But uh, when you're not busy, what, what else, how, how do you fill your time when you have free time? What do you like to do? Uh, these days, I like to keep fit. Um, I've been training and uh, did my first uh, triathlon. Uh, so that's been helping me a lot recently. Before that, I was a pretty serious golfer. Um, and... Yeah, apart from that, yeah, I enjoy the sunshine, but I uh, I do work a lot. <laughs> yeah, well, um, many of us, many of us have to. The world is not seem does not seem to be getting any easier. Uh, people used to think, oh, well, you know, I retire at the age of sixty or sixty five or whatever, and many many people reach that date and they still keep working. Um, Indeed, I actually had uh, was going around various government establishments and different bits and pieces today, and was incredible the amount of over seventies that were actually working at computers and desks. Yeah, yeah, I'm you know, I'm, not, I'm not surprised. So this is uh, this is a session for dealing with um, live issues. Um, I guess I'm just another question before we get into that. Uh, have you had any kind of sort of mental health, self-development type uh, uh, training or coaching or experience? Um, I did study sports and golf psychology um, quite a bit uh, when I was in my 20s. And actually, I had I'd aspired to be, to be a golf coach um, um, to tie that in with playing golf. Uh, so I did study a lot to do with sports psychology, and I think um, that's eventually how I came across your own material, because the first uh, insight I had into Dr. Steve Simpson was through a book called, was it Magic Golf? Play Magic Golf, it was indeed. the first. Play book Magic book. Golf, that's it, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So I got that book, yes, as part of all that learning I was doing at that time. Yeah, it was absolutely, uh, what shall we say, and intrigued and, and enthused and immersed in all that stuff at that point. Yeah, trying to develop my own game, but then obviously make a, a career of it, which unfortunately I didn't inevitably manage to do because life takes over sometimes and you have to do what you've got to do to pay the bills. You do, and um, that's uh, 
that's why uh, another book that I wrote, which was called Get Lucky Now, which was is the official title of this seminar, because uh, life does definitely get in the way, uh, sometimes for good and sometimes for not so good. But uh, we'll maybe talk about that a, a little bit later. But uh, you chose a good subject, um, the psychology of golf, because uh, whilst it's true, you know, it's difficult, it can be quite difficult to make a living in that field uh, until unless you get lucky. <laughs> um, and, you know, I'm kind of thrilled. I was honored to be quite lucky myself. And so, you know, I have worked with tour players and I've been on the tour. And um, COVID, of course, put an end to all of that. But again, the golf world's fast returning to normal. But with the with your experience as a golfer and with your knowledge of uh, sports and golf psychology, uh, if I were to ask you, like in a nutshell, what is one what is one tip that you would uh, share with a golfer who was struggling? Um, I think you've got to listen to your intuition uh more and if you are having a bad day on the golf course stay positive and try to find out why you're having a bad day on the golf course and fix it rather than just complain that everything in the world is going against you because there'll always be a learning experience in there and the reason you're having a bad day or not feeling your best is because something's not quite right in your game and needs fixed uh so yeah you've got to battle you've got to battle to the end and that's not just golf that's life itself uh and remember the only important step or shot is the next one well that's uh that's more than a nutshell that's sorry so, no no it's good i mean um i couldn't agree with you more about all of those comments you've made i would um, actually say i go sorry to interrupt but i would actually say that I have learned that more and more through my recent triathlon experience as much as I ever did with golf because I had had an accident three months before the event, wasn't able to train and had a bad knee and a bad back when I went into the event. And I had no idea when I turned up on the day whether I was going to be able to complete or finish the event. And that's what, uh, as I do, I've done previously on some runs especially, which can get tough, is to say the only thing I need to do is take the next step. And I just kept doing that and kept doing that and kept doing that. And eventually I got to the end and the exhilaration was just incredible. Um, and I think golfers and other sports people probably find the same thing happens to them when they have the same mindset and they get the same end result. It's completing their task. Well, what you've just said is so important and you're absolutely right. Really, it doesn't, it doesn't really matter whether we're talking about a triathlon now, golf, or, or just living. There are various expressions that people use to, uh, to summarize that. And uh, they, they, you, might, you might hear things like, you know, I have to live in the moment. I live in the now. I, 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 I am present. I live in the present. And when we can do that, and it does take a, quite a lot of self-control, you see, because we've got, we have our unconscious mind, which is massively powerful, but which we are almost totally unaware of, which actually does all the thinking for us. And then we've got this little bit higher up, which uh, is called the conscious mind, much smaller. And yet within the conscious mind is a thing called the ego. And we all, all have the ego. Mm -hmm. And the ego has got a real power complex. It, uh, it's, it really is the over controller. It will try and over control everything we do in our life. And it will do its best to drag us away from the moment because when we're in the moment, Ego knows we're connected to the unconscious mind. And earlier on, you were talking about, uh, uh, back to your golf, you know, what should a golfer do? You, fit, you said, I think uh, that intuition is very important. Well, intuition is very important because when we can connect to intuition, life gets a lot easier for us. So I guess the question that we all ask is, well, how can we connect to intuition? And this is a subject I talk a lot about because quite a lot of my 
um, clients are professional poker players, including the world champion. So they know um, better than anybody really, or better than the best, that um, if, if, if they can't read people, if they can't connect to these, this deeper unconscious mind, they're not gonna make it at the top level. And staying in the moment is very much one of the first things that all of us can do to make sure that we do keep corrected and grounded because the ego can't interfere with that. The moment only lasts a moment and that's the only thing we're in control of. And practices that uh, people have found helpful as well. Um, meditation helps to create a quiet mind and it quietens down the ego. And again, it allows these messages to filter up, which would, you know, would otherwise get blocked. You see, we all have intuition, and I'm speaking to all the people now who will be watching this. We all have intuition, even if it doesn't feel like it. The problem is, is that there's so much busyness here. As I've said, the intuition just can't make itself heard. And uh, I think earlier on we were talking about, uh, actually just before the show started, we were talking about we're going to see you know, where this goes and uh, we're going to hope the invisible giants are going to hold our hands and guide us wisely. And so that's good. Can I ask a question just yes, on a of couple course. of the bits that you've been talking about there? Yeah. I was going to say the ego is a definite issue, I think, for, for many people. It's something I've uh, been looking into quite recently, actually. And I heard a very succinct saying which says, your ego is not your amigo. You'll have heard this as well. But um, I thought, yeah, that's exactly it. Your ego is not your amigo. You, you, you may think that it is. And it's helping you to be the big man or to to do something in a certain way or uh, but it's not necessarily your friend. And there's absolutely no way, going back to the second part that you said, there's absolutely no way that you can hear the messages that you need to be hearing if your mind's busy and full of as a golfing example. Maybe somebody, why do I always three putt the 15th green? Why do I always put it in the bushes at the 12th? Why why does it always go wrong for me on the last two holes? And why does this playing partner always annoy me? And these things that are normal that happen and challenges that people have to go through and the meditation and getting into that quiet space is definitely something that everybody has to try and do. You know, it's difficult but they have to try and do that in order to, to hear what they need to be hearing, which is maybe that little message that their alignment's off or they're not, they're not turning around their right knee or turning their hips properly or if they're not leading with their hands into the ball uh, enough. Uh, the, the, there's something that's going wrong with their swing that day that, that's making it look like everything else is going wrong. And a lot of the time it could be something quite simple like that. But you need to be able to hear that message. You need to hear the message. And I think that kind of introduces a, a concept that I found very useful. And uh, it's from the work of Carl Jung, the psychologist, and he, he, uh, he, he used the word synchronicity to describe that's which synchronicity is another word for luck. Um, he, he described synchronicity as a falling together in time. Now, what on earth did he mean by that? I mean, I'm not going to try and get my head around that. But what he said is that synchronicity is an ever present reality. It's an ever-present reality for those who have eyes to see. So he was saying in different words pretty much what you were saying. It's, and it's out there, and this should be incredibly reassuring for all of us. We know that there's something out there that we can tap into which makes our life easier. Okay, we're talking about another name maybe for those invisible giants that we were mentioning, but I'm convinced of it. I'm convinced in the work that I do with people. I'm convinced in you know what's happened to me that uh, uh, if we can if we can do those things that tap us into that intuition, that's when that we first of all we're going to see the synchronicities. We're going to see those opportunities that have always been there, but we were just literally blind to them, and. Uh, 
It's coincidences as well. There's too many coincidences in life that you look back on and say, gosh, yeah, I was put there for a reason because that led to that and led to that and led to that and took me to where I am today, which is where I need to be. And another way that you can think of which keeps you in the present, which because of these things I've had to learn a lot recently to, to get me through some difficult times uh, that I've had. Um, and to think at this very moment, I'm exactly where I need to be no matter what is yeah. along those lines that so you're you you are where you need where you are right now for a reason. Exactly. Whether it's good or bad or indifferent, you need to go through the bad bit to get to where you got to go. But where you are right now is where you need to be. Yeah, well, um I, I mean some of the most eminent people of all time have said much the same thing. I, Einstein was convinced that there is nothing random in life he said everything is uh, is, is pre preordained in some way and uh, that got him thrown out of the uh, the jewish faith because that obviously clashed with what they the things that they were teaching and uh, there are many other scientists who think the same and uh, you know I, I think einstein said something like uh, uh, he, he he said he said um, reality he said reality is an illusion uh, but it's a highly persistent one. And, and he felt that the things that are going on in the universe that we don't understand, it's just because we don't have that breadth of knowledge, uh, certainly not now and maybe not ever, but underneath it, there will be a pattern. So... Can I, ask a, can I ask a question? This is maybe slightly slightly off subject, but while I remember it, and it's not really off subject, as was talking about intuition... Why is it sometimes that I've found, and I know other people have as well, with regards gambling on sports? Now, I know you do poker and stuff like that as well, and the same thing will apply. Your poker players will be sitting there, and probably a lot of the time they know when they're going to win, and that gives them confidence, and they'll know when they're not going to win, and they can fold their hand. I'm not an expert in poker by any manner, it means... But I have found that, and other people have found that, with gambling streaks. Now, I have had reasonable success, not big amounts of money, on betting on golfers mainly. But I just get, I just get an intuition that somebody is going to win that event, and it's really, really weird how they do. And then other times, you, you just, I couldn't pick my nose with it. I would be so far off, and I can feel that I'm far off. And... How do you tap into that knowing more often is what I guess my question is and probably something that a lot of other people would like to know as well. Why can't I access that clear intuition as often and why does it come and go so quickly? And when it's there, it's like it's going to be there forever. And when it's not there, it's like it's never coming back. Well, this, this is the, the magic that people want to catch in a, in a bottle. And you're quite right. It's, uh, it's, uh, I, I describe it as uh, the harder you... The, it's, it's a bit like... It's very similar to being in the zone. It, it's a state of mind. It's a mind state that is just very focused and very efficient, which bypasses all of the clutter that's going on up here. And... It's counterintuitive because the harder you try to get into that mind state, the further away you're going to go. You have to let this thing come to you. And the yes. way you let, let it come to you is by letting go of the over-controlling. Because it will come to all of us. Uh, we all have the ability to be more intuitive. And I've talked on this subject to teachers, uh, I've, I've spoken to policemen, I've spoken to people from customs, and they'll always say, you know, they get a hunch. They get a hunch yeah. this person's smuggling, they get a hunch this person's got a gun. A teacher told me, he said, you know, I'm, 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 you know I have to invigilate the exams at the end of term. And he said, no, no, I watched the kids, they got the pencil, because it's all multiple choice, and the pencil's hovering over the right answer. And then at the last minute, they go and pick another one. Yes. So um, 
is that when the ego's coming back into it then? So say it you is. win a cup you win a couple of bets because you've had the intuition and then you start saying, Gosh, well, I could pick anything and then you go. I find it's if you start if you start looking for bets. Yeah. Like if you go, if I go on and say, right, I'm going to have a bet. And then I start scouring all the football matches, golfers, like snooker players, etc. That doesn't seem to work. No. However, if you're sort of, if I'm like maybe sweeping the floor in the room and Sky Sports are on and somebody's names mentioned, say a golfer's names mentioned, and it just pings in your brain and you think, ah, it's maybe not that time, but it's going to be soon. Keep that golfer in mind because he'll come. Yeah, well, and and of course you know we uh, th th this is the way you spend some of your spare time. You're interested in the statistics, all that kind of stuff, and um, but uh, I would like to stress that it just works in any aspect of your life. And as as a coach, typically people don't come to me when when things are going well. Uh, I mean, they probably should because when things are going well, we want to keep things going well. Because all, 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 all of the, you know, we all have hot streaks and cold streaks, and we know for sure that the tide is always going to turn. So they'll come to me when they're in a bad patch, and you know, with the poker players, they will talk to me as long as we have really, um, and they'll they'll we, we'll they'll talk for a while about one hand where they lost um, James. Welcome. I, I can't I can't hear you by the way, but anyway, you'll get a chance to talk in a moment. Um, but I, um, I'm doing some work here with Stephen, as you know, we're getting intuition and we've been talking a little bit of, about golf and I you know I know that's you, that's you have a background in that. So anyway, these poker players they they will call me um, when they're on tilt, when they're having a bad run, and they'll tell me in detail about the hand they've been playing and where they went wrong. So sooner or later, they have to take a breath and I jump in and I say, hey, can I say something? They say, laugh, I say, yeah, yeah, of course. I said, when you were playing this big hand and the pot was rising, what was your first thought about the person who was sitting opposite you, who you were pitted against? What was your first thought when that, when that hand started? And he said, well, I felt that he'd got something pretty good. I felt he'd got, you know, his whole cards with two aces. Nothing comes better than that. But as things developed, um, I, I, I wasn't so sure. I wasn't so sure. And I felt confident that I could put a lot of money in and take him on. And, of course, I was wrong. I got it. And I said, well, you know, this is... Uh, this is the, the mantra I say to the poker players, you know, so I know it off by heart. Your first thought is usually your best thought. And when you change, just like the kids who are about to tick the right answer, once they change it, that's when the ego has come in and they've overthought it and they've got, they've just flitted out of that wonderful place they call the zone. So yeah, that's the way it goes. And these opportunities, of talking to people when they're on a down, when luck is turning against them, is actually a great, great opportunity because I think you mentioned earlier on that from our mistakes or from things that didn't work, we learn the most. I remember Usain Bolt, the sprinter, saying, before you can win, before you can win, you have to learn how to lose. And the point that he was making is that nobody becomes a champion overnight. It took Edison over 300 failed experiments and being ridiculed by his colleagues because he couldn't make his experiments work. And he just took it in his stride because he knew if he kept on experimenting, kept on learning, the light bulb would go on. So intuition, yeah. Um, tell me, um, tell me, a little more about what a triathlon involves. I've got a rough idea. I know it's three sports, but I don't know what they are and what it involves. Can you just briefly give me a clue? Uh, I can't hear you, Stephen. I think you've uh, muted or something.
Is that better? Yeah, you're back. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, we've lost you again. Okay, while, while, you, while you're getting yourself sorted out, Stephen, I just want to have a, a, a word with James while he's here, okay? And, and I'll come back to you. Um, James, um, you know, welcome. Glad you could join. Oh, uh, I think you're a mute, muted as well. There's a button somewhere down there you can press and open yourself up. Got it. How's that? Ah, yeah, that's perfect. We got My you. apologies. Yeah. Sorry, Stephen. I had a client to run on. I'm just quite happy to sit and listen to you. I've got your book. I know you. I've come to your stuff. I just in here to soak up a bit more. And the funny thing is, you saying about intuition. The other day I was thinking, I must get in touch with Stephen. I want to do a bit of a refresher on that luck. The next day, bing, I get an email. <laughs> so, <laughs> so a bit of a cosmic download. So I'm quite happy to just sit and listen and absorb it. I'm still doing my therapy and coaching. I'm doing more coaching. Um, I've been asked to do some coaching for the armed services, actually, which I'm quite looking forward to. And most of my stuff's in golf. But I'm just thinking about, for me personally, you know, how can I become more lucky? How can I have opportunities drop in my lap or be open to them or create a space for them or what have you? Well, that's what we've been talking about this evening and, um, and, and uh, we'll certainly talk more about it. In fact, uh, talking about that synchronicity, we actually were talking about synchronicities and how when you get, you know, it seems like the universe knows when you deserve a bit of a reward or something and it all points you in the right direction. Um, so, um, yeah, if you're happy, I mean, feel free to chip in, but if, if you're happy and, and maybe we could get you in more detail on a future show, because I would... That's like, fine. Yeah, great. Fine. Um, Stephen, uh, are, are we... Uh, have we got uh, all systems working now? I think so, yeah. I'm just, I'm not quite used to this and I've um, just been tapping little buttons and stuff and doing the wrong thing, obviously. Um, you've got me now, yeah? Great. Um, yeah. Well, so a triathlon will be typically is, uh, well, an Olympic distance triathlon is 1.5 kilometer swimming generally in the sea or a river or a lake. Um then you get out the water, uh, quickly get changed into a tri suit or other whatever you want to wear, get on a bike, and it's a 40 kilometer cycle um, around a predetermined route, wherever that may be, maybe flat or in the mountains or wherever. And then you go back to the transition area and uh, dump your bike, get your trainers on, and run 10 kilometers until you come back and finish the race. Uh, well, there are there are longer triathlons and that middle distance goes to, uh, I think, four kilometres, 90 kilometres and 20 for the run. That's like called a half Ironman. And then a full Ironman, which I still quite can't quite get my head around yet. I would never say never, but... Um, I just I'm not I'm not quite sure how people do this, but I think that is is a four mile, which is about seven kilometers swim, which would be absolutely exhausting for most people anyway. They then cycle 180 kilometers. Okay. All right. Then they, then they get off the bike and 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 run. 40 kilometers, which is 26 miles. So that's basically, so all these people that do the London Marathon or a marathon of 26 miles, that's a magnificent achievement. But there are people on a regular basis doing a seven mile swim and a 180 kilometer bike ride before they start such a marathon. <laughs> well, I mean, um, this, 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 this is amazing. And an NLP technique here that I can share with you is if, is if there's something that you want to be better at in your life, a good start is to identify somebody you know. It could be living, dead. You could know them personally. Could you just know somebody you've read a book or you've seen them on screen or something. 
And when you've got your head into that nice quiet place where we, you know, which opens, opens up the doors to intuition or synchronicity, just, just picture in your mind's eye what it would be like to be inside that person and to, you know, what would they say? How would they handle with this? What, what can you take away and, and learn from? So, uh, I mean, I'm in awe about, uh, well, people who achieve a marathon, but uh, to me, a triathlon, the one that you're doing in, uh, as I mentioned, I'm, you know, massive respect for that. And it wasn't just the fact that um, you, you completed it, but um, I think you were saying earlier you had had an accident uh, and then you decided you needed to get fit and train for it. Have I got that right? No, I was training to get fit before that. Oh, before, okay. I had started sort of maybe a couple of years before that, but I hadn't run and since I played football as a teenager. Um, not well, semi-serious, not too serious, not professional by any manner of means. Um, so then I went into golf. So the first time I'd actually ran was like two years before the event, but it was supposed to be six months after I had started, but the event got cancelled because of COVID. Then it got cancelled again the following year. So this was it just coming round. So I had been training and looking forward to it and getting better. And then I was out on my road bike one day on a, a small dual carriageway in Cyprus. And some uh, chap in a pickup truck decides to come through the roundabout while I'm going round it on my route and knock me straight off my bike to the ground. Uh so it had a big impact the way I landed on my hip, knee, and my back. And um, had to get a lot of medical attention, physiotherapy, and stuff like that. But the whole time, I still had in my head that I was going to do this triathlon. It was basically two months later it was. I was going to do it if I possibly could. And the doctors were telling me, no, no triathlon, leave it, leave it six months and start again. And I just, for some reason, somewhere inside me, I refused to accept it. And I said I was going to do it. And I wasn't really able to train properly. What I did, though, was I made the best of it. And the one thing I was able to do was still swim. And swimming was probably my weakest uh, discipline out of the three. It's not something that I'd done or practiced too much. I would more go out for a cycle. I would go out for a cycle first if I was given the choice. I would go out for a run and really end up enjoying that more than the cycle inevitably if I actually got myself to do it. Um, but swimming, I didn't really do too much. But that was all I could do. So I had to do it. And I got better at it. I was enjoying it. And I think that's what carried me through at the end of the day. I was sore the whole way around on the cycle and basically limped around the run, but I didn't stop and I still did it. And as I said to you on the email, there was there was people, I was astounded. There was young athletes who had all the gear on, good looking, looked really fit, had the toned bodies and everything. They were, they were walking on the run. They had had enough. They couldn't do anymore. And here's me limping around it saying, there's no way I'm stopping. And actually seeing them was giving the more people that I saw like that was giving me more confidence that I could do it and that I was going to do it and I was going to complete it. And then to be honest, towards the end, I had to actually keep saying those words out loud. The people <laughs> that were marshalling must have been looking at me. I'm saying, I'm going to finish, I'm going to finish, I'm going to finish <laughs> until yeah. I get to the finish line. Well, that's why um, I was so keen to hear your story because... Uh, you know, I'm, you know, in, I feel inspired by listening to it. And, and I know that the people who, who watch this recording will be as well. And we would mentioned earlier that you were, you had had a number of knockbacks in life this time, various things that, you know, outside your control. So you weren't in a, in a good place and you were doing, you, the one good thing was you were getting yourself fit. And then something happens suddenly, as they say, and you find yourself on the floor and you've got those injuries. And, you know, speaking as a doctor, I'd have been just like your doctors. I'd have said, well, you know, it's probably going to take you six months to get over that. But you confounded the experts. And 
that's what I'm trying to identify here. Where did that come from? It wasn't like, you know, you're on the crest of a wave, everything was going swimmingly. It wasn't. So you found a part of your life where you were able to do something quite exceptional. I mean, in a nutshell, what, what would you say was the thing that took you through to the other side of that experience? Yeah. I am quite a determined person. And throughout my golfing career, I did show a great amount of determination. But I think inevitably, I mean, I know you wrote a book, I think, and spoke about pushing at open doors. And it just seemed to be that one, one time after another, and probably looking back on it, I take my own advice. There was probably reasons for it and things that I had to look at, but golf just didn't seem to be an open door for me. No matter how hard I tried, how many events that I trained for and what I did, it, it just it didn't seem to work out when I really wanted it to work out. But maybe I just wasn't ready mentally for it. And when it came to the triathlon, I was like, took the Tiger Woods attitude because what his attitude towards golf is, even when he was had all these injuries and stuff, he would never give up on a round of golf. And even, I think, in 2020, Tiger Woods had a 9 or a 10, I think, at the 12th at Augusta. And he could have, most golfers would have thrown in the towel and probably bogeyed their way in from there. He actually had four birdies in the last five holes after that, even though he was completely out of the tournament. So Tiger Woods' mantra and attitude is never, never give up, never let it beat you. And when I transitioned from golf to triathlon, I said, that is the attitude I'm going to have. It will not beat me. I will never, I will never give up on a run. I will never go home early from a cycle. Uh, I will always complete it. If I don't want to do it again, then fine, but I will complete this mission here now in front of me. Yeah, that's uh, that's that's wonderful. So, um, um, one one tip for anybody who's watching this, who's who's facing you know uphill uphill struggles, one short tip. They've... It's happening for a reason, and you're always being tested. Yeah. Well, that's that's uh, many many people believe that, and um, uh, in, in, I, I, I don't know if you have you've you've heard of Kabbalah, and I'm not a big Kabbalist, but I have to study so many different things as a mind coach. But that is one of their uh, important beliefs. They they say that life is a set of challenges. And that if you try and stay in your comfort zone, that's where you stay, you know, at a fairly low level. You're missing out on an awful lot of what's up there that you could aspire to. And when you look at uh, setbacks more as opportunities to move up another level, then um, that can give comfort to people. And I would say as well, just to add to that, one thing I kept thinking about in my mind, even to this day in some ways, was why was I knocked off my bike? Well, um, why, this is... Why did it happen? This is a question I've asked myself, and obviously you, you can obviously give me your insight, but I'll tell you mine first, is because after that triathlon, I had some much bigger life challenges, which I won't go into okay. um, on, in this forum. Um, came to me and I had to apply the same mindset than I did that I did in my triathlon. Uh, I was basically, I felt handicapped, but I had to keep going. And I believe without that triathlon experience and without it being the experience it was, that it wasn't all plain sailing. And I really had to dig deep and I had to battle through the injuries and stuff like that. It actually stood me instead in some ways for what was about to come next. And that's perhaps why it happened rather than to be anything to do with a triathlon at all. I think it was to make me grow as a person. Well, I, I can't give you the answer uh, to why did it happen. Um, but what I can tell you is that you're far from alone. And in fact, it, this is a bit of a morbid subject, but um, I've, I, I've, heard, uh, I've heard and seen people who've, say, say, had a terrible spinal injury and they're, you know, they're almost like quadriplegic and they've, they might, people who maybe were very keen sportsmen or very fit or all the rest of it, 
And they go through, obviously, severe depression and stress and anxiety during their recovery period. But at least the ones that I'm aware of, uh, they reached a point where they actually see that their life has actually, hard for us to believe, their life has improved. They've mm-hmm. learned something about themselves they would have never learned another way. And they even say, if I could put the clock back so that this event didn't happen, I wouldn't do it. Yeah. Now, I can't get my head around that, but they, I can tell they mean it really sincerely. And um, James is a golfing example here. There's a... There's a, a, a a a man from the Caribbean who was really a star um, baseball player, you know, up and coming, had a very promising future ahead of him. And he had an accident and he lost one of his legs. And of course he went through this terrible grieving thing. And, um, but he had, he decided that the way he was going to come out of it, he was going to learn how to play golf. He was going to learn how to play golf. And, And actually I've, been on the tour and I've seen some of these people who have severe disabilities and I'm telling you it's amazing you know they might have lost an arm they might have lost a leg um a a hand somehow they they've learned how to play golf and in fact they have proper competitions they go all over the world now but anyway this this chap um makes a a living as a one-legged golfer because he can hit the ball. He's got this way that he spins through the ball and he, he can hit the ball further than the tall players can. I mean, it's just a total uh, in, in, incredible performance. So why did these things happen? I don't know. But what I, can, what I do know is that in your case, Stephen, and um, in these people that I've just been talking about, they get some deep conviction from within themselves that they're able to use in a different direction. I think it goes, it brings up the, you'll have probably read the book of Dale Carnegie, Think and Grow Rich. Yeah, um, I, I have actually, actually, it, actually, yes, I have. And actually it was written by Napoleon Hill, but he was very much a, uh, uh, a, a, a partnership it. with Dale Carnegie, yes. Yeah, apologies. So, there was one thing in there which I got in sales training when I was younger, one of my previous jobs. And it says, in every adversity, there is a seed of equivalent or greater benefit. And I think that sums up most of what we've been talking about here. Yeah. And- yeah. Before you, can, uh, before you can learn to win, you have to learn to lose. As I'm saying, it Bolt said, as I quoted earlier. Um, now... Think, think and Grow Rich. I read it the first time and I thought it was rubbish. And about a, couple, about a year or two later, I read it again and I thought this is brilliant uh, because I, I had obviously wasn't ready for it. So what, what I want to do to this, uh, in this webinar now is kind of bring it to a close, but I want us to do something that uh, the people who are watching will be able to do it as well. And, and James, you please join in. This is for all of us in the circle. Um, and... A word that psychologists use a lot is visualization. And if we can can build a really good picture in our mind's eye or in our mind of something that we want to achieve, it definitely seems to be that it it increases the odds a lot of of us being successful, or maybe even realizing that we don't actually want this thing. And, uh, and that's one of the secrets of lucky people from my book, Get Lucky Now, of visualization. Because I've had clients who knew exactly what they wanted out of life. I remember one in particular, he was a very wealthy man. Um, he wanted a big country house. He wanted the two BMWs. He wanted a beautiful wife, a kid, a beautiful dog, you know, with long floppy ears, all, you know, an open top sports car, and a swimming pool. All those things he knew. And I talked to him about visualization, and I said... Can you, in your mind's eye, I mean, when you close your eyes or before you go to bed, you're lying on the bed, before you fall asleep, do you visualize these things? And uh, he said, yeah, I do really, really well. And I told, I said, well, tell me, tell me what's in the picture. And he told me, and I thought, yeah, this is all good. What, what, what can I do? He's doing all the right things. And then it just struck me. Um, there was one thing missing in the picture and that was him. 
he wasn't in the picture. He was like looking on at other people, you know, this wonderful, perfect family having a great time. He just made one little thing. He hadn't put himself in the picture. <laughs> um, so again, before we do this exercise, just one more. I mean, back to the world of golfer, Jack Nicklaus, world of golfer, the best player ever. If you number of majors won uh, at the moment. And there's, in his book, there's a paragraph that uh, I almost know word perfect. I, I mean, it's not word perfect, but it's close enough. He, didn't, he never uses the word visualization because it didn't exist in his days. This is, or, or if he did, he was, as far as I know, he didn't have any psychology training. He said, I never hit a golf ball, even in practice, without having a big picture of a white ball, a large white ball lying in the middle of beautiful green grass. And then there's a kind of a fade out where I'm looking at myself and I'm seeing myself hit the shot in slow motion and the ball is traveling in slow motion to exactly where I wanted it to go. So that was his, his idea of a visualization. And he would use, as he said, every shot he hit, even in practice. I don't know whether that's true or not. That's certainly what he said. He called it going to the movies. Going to the movies. Is that what he called it? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. That's a good expression. Yeah. Because in my book, uh, get, uh, Play Magic Golf, I, th I think I said, make magic movies. That was one of the things I talked about. Create, create confidence, make magic movies, and talk tender. Uh, try to make them, you know, beginning with the same letters. Talk tender means don't beat, basically don't beat yourself up. The biggest failing that people have, including myself, of course, um, is that we beat ourselves up when things go wrong. We don't take the attitude that, uh, Stephen, you've been talking about where you think, well, you know, maybe it happened for the best. Maybe I learned something from it. Because if you're beating yourself up, you can't be confident. People, quite a few people have come to me for, they want more confidence. And I say, well, you've come to the wrong place. You already have confidence because confidence is a, is a default setting for the human psyche. Um, how do I know that? Well, you watch a bit, you look at the babies or, and, and young kids. They don't have any self-doubt. They all think they're wonderful, even if other people don't. But sooner or later, they learn to start beating themselves up, and that gets in the way of their confidence. Anyway, we're talking about visualization now. So it's all about finding that state in our mind where we're calm, we're focused, we're like, it's a little bit like being inside a bubble and we're connecting to intuition. We're connecting to the deeper powers of the unconscious mind and giving them permission to speak, giving them permission to give us hints so that we don't need something really bad to happen to us before we get the message. So I would invite you all and anybody watching this now, obviously if you're not, not if you're driving a car, but close your eyes and think of a time when things really were going your way. It doesn't matter whether it's at work, at home, with your friends and family, or whether you're on your own. Think of a time when things really went well. You knew they were going well. You weren't beating yourself up. Uh, it all felt easy. And now we're gonna add some layers to that visualization. And this is an NLP term, uh, they call them submodalities because our whole experience of life is through our five senses, what we see, what we hear, what we feel, what we taste and what we smell. And for most people, visualization is the biggest part of that. So, the fun th funny thing is, is when we close our eyes, we see more. We can imagine more. So that wonderful time when you were in flow, when things were really going well, let's put a bit of detail to it. Were you on your own? If not, who were you with? What were they wearing? What were you wearing? 
What was the, were you in outdoors? If so, what was the color of the sky? Was it windy day? We, what was the, were the trees there? Could you hear any animal noises, any bird song? What did you had to eat that day? Put as many details into that picture, as irrelevant as they might be, because what you're doing is you're getting back into those neural pathways that were firing so effectively for you then. And when we can do that, when we can play that video over and over again, the memories are easier to retrieve and become more real. So it feels like how we felt then, we start feeling like it right now. And the scientists call that uh, lamination, my, sorry, myelination. The myelin sheath around those nerves grows thicker and thicker the more it's used. It's just like a thicker cable of a copper cable transmits electricity, more electricity faster uh, than a thin one. Now, let's add another little bit of detail to this picture. And let's uh, recall how we, what, how we felt during this time. What was the emotion that we were feeling when we were in flow on this occasion? And in one word, and keep this word to yourself for the moment, in one word, just think, okay, one word to describe my, my feelings, my emotions that day. And then, again, just keep this to yourself in your own mind. If this word, whatever it might be, had a color, what, what was the color? And then finally, connecting to your intuition. The intuition loves little puzzles like this. The question is, so how could I use this one word of how I felt and how can I use this color? How can I use it to make, to bring these feelings, these memories back solidly bigger, brighter, bolder, so that they're there forever and I can use them on demand? So have a little think about that. And now think of a situation in your life at the moment. And start to visualize how you would like that situation to resolve itself. Hmm. And again, was there anything you learned from going back in your memory banks that you could bring forward to this new situation? Again, visualizing what it is that you want. Now, of course, what you may what you may want, you may change your mind, but that doesn't matter. We've got to have we've got to have a starting point for this journey. All journeys start somewhere. And build that picture up so that, that picture is just as big as the one from the past. And Make sure that you're right in the picture. It's like a, a camera's looking on you. You can see yourself in the frame, but also you can see yourself looking out of your own eyes in this situation. So you're getting two different perspectives, the camera view of watching you and then you being the camera. So open your eyes now and um, uh, James, if I could come to you, uh, yeah. yeah. What was uh, what was the word that you came up with? Joyful. Joyful. Joyful is a really good word. Joy is one of the most powerful human emotions that we can have. So, uh, and yeah, yeah, I can imagine how great that felt. 
And um, what was the colour you associated with it? Like, like pale blue, not too dissimilar from the wall behind me. Just not uh, dissimilar you know, to the wall that's behind me. The pale oh, blue of that. Oh, very, exactly. I was looking. At, I was looking at your T-shirt. That looks pale. Oh, that's blue. a bit more grey, but is, is it? Yeah, but you know, like a yeah, on the light sea day, it's lovely and blue, blue and calming and peaceful. Okay, and. Um, did you come up with any ideas about how you might be able to use that, the word? And yeah, the yeah, for sure. So the joyful feeling was from childhood, you know, sort of my late teenage years uh, on a motocross bike. It was just so much fun. Really carefree, footloose. And, you know, like you say, our brain isn't fully developed then, so we just let it all hang out and enjoy ourselves. Bringing that carefree feeling to the present for some of the stuff I'm doing, you know, coaching big teams and what have you just sort of having more fun with it I, I think that would I'm sure that would be very successful um, some some sports people take themselves too seriously and they take <laughs> their sport too seriously well if we're talking about golf it's a ball and a stick come on a ball and a stick exactly <laughs> um, yeah thank you James for that that's good you'll, you'll keep us informed as to how things work out have you, have you got your project? You don't need to tell us what it is, but you Yeah, I've, I've got a couple of irons in the fire. Let's just see how that pans out. Some of them have got, um, it's sort of stuff I've done before, but it's slightly different. So a bit more group work and what have you. So I just, you know, yeah, I think certainly let's let everyone have a bit more fun rather than just telling everyone what to do. Good for you. That would be great fun. But then, and for, and for you, energy yeah. always flows both ways. How about you, Stephen? What was your word? Um, it's not an emotion as such, but the word that was kept coming to my mind was forward. And okay, doesn't doesn't have to be an emotion. Forward. I think it goes along the same lines of what I've been talking about earlier. And that um, I had, there was a very I did have a very successful event in uh, in golf at one point, believe it or not, but. <laughs> um, the, the, the time that it did go really well and I won a significant event that I really wanted to win um, in my club um, when I was playing the final. that, that I, I, I didn't think about it at the time, but when I was visualising just now, that was, that's kind of what I was doing. I was just going from shot to shot to shot uh, and just trying my best with every shot in it. And it just, there doesn't seem any doubt that it was going to go my way, inevitably. Um, and uh, on that occasion, it did, yeah. And um, if I had had uh, such a technique that you've just demonstrated uh, to carry into, into other ones and been able to try that, then maybe it would have helped. Well, maybe it would. And um, and what was the uh, the colour of, of for, associate, that you, you associated with forward? Well, the golf course that I was on that day was kind of giving me the colour. So it was like a very, it was summer. So um, in Scotland, uh, the green grass of a, a kind of lynx inland, but lynxy type field got a lot of it had went that sort of brown colour that the lynx grass goes on a golf course. Yeah. So if you can imagine the sort of burnt lynx grass colour. Um, that was a colour that I was imagining. That that's a colour that comes to me when I think about that time and that event. Okay. And um, when you were giving some thought to how you could use all this for something in the future or something you would like to achieve, did you get any insights there? I've overlaid it onto a personal situation that I hope has a good outcome and um, imagine the people that are involved um, in amongst that colour and good things happening. Good things happening to other people as well. Yeah. Yes, for sure, yes. Yeah, now there, there, is, there is a secret um, that works, that of course people have always known. And um, if, uh, if somebody, if I see somebody who's kind of struggling to feel good about themselves or what you know, what their future might hold for them, or whatever. I say, look, if you really can't think of anything, there's something that always works and will make you feel better, and that is um, come from a giving place, help another person, even in a small way. 
even just holding the door open for them, um, mm -hmm. it, it makes you feel good. It's a, you get a payback. You're doing a good thing, an unselfish thing, but it's like you're getting rewarded. And um, so, yeah, I, so I, I like that you had you you had a, that warm feeling for other people in your plan. Yeah, I, I was there as well, but I had to I had to consciously put myself in there as well because yeah. initially the 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 image was just of them and them being happy. Um, but I put myself in there towards the end as well, and I guess the next time I do it, which I will practice it again. I'll I'll do I'll maybe do that a little bit earlier. Yes, yes. It's uh, you're not being selfish. Um, it's it's there for everybody. It's you know it's there for for you. It's there for you, the people around you as well. Uh, I mean it's it's very it's a very um, it's it's a very natural thing to actually keep yourself in the background. Um, but when we're doing our visualization, that doesn't work. We've got to be in there. Remember, this is our own private movie. We're not being boastful. We're not being pompous. It's okay. I'll tell you another story, actually, because what you were saying there brings to mind there's a taxi driver out here in Cyprus that helps us a lot. And um, he's a very big, gregarious character, and he entertains everybody on the journeys and stuff like that. Very, very positive man. And um, he always has that mantra. He says, it's amazing. The more I give, the more I receive. He's become like the busiest taxi driver on the whole island. And what he actually did was, I mean, the, the norm for taxi drivers that get you from the airport or, and, and not just here, but a lot of the other countries as well, is they'll maybe try and put the price up and maybe try it on with people and get a bit of an extra fare and kind of maybe take them a long way around to get the price up and stuff like that. They've got like that kind of attitude that's probably the wrong attitude, but he'll actually do it the reverse way around. He'll go and show people around and say, have a look at this and have a look at that and you should go there. He'll also give them a discount. What he'll also do is he'll probably, he'll give them bottles of water or cans of beer that don't cost him very much, but they mean a lot to the people that have just come off a long flight and get in a taxi and are ready to start their holiday. And he, he says, he says, it's unbelievable. The more I give, the more I receive. He says, the wealth that I've accumulated since I started giving more, you would never believe. Yes, indeed so. And um, well, we're um, we're running out of time now, uh, but uh, let me just uh, give a reference here for people that might find it useful. Um, what what you're talking about, if you give something, you get it back the same or even or usually more. It's called the law of reciprocity, and uh, probably the best book on um, persuasion and influence, which you you may be familiar with, is uh, written by an, an author called Chia. Cialdini, and it's called Persuasion and Influence. And I think he has something like six laws that people can use in sales or in their life or whatever. And that law of recipro reciprocity is, is, is one of them. So um, I thank you for uh, all of you for, for, for sharing details of your life, frankly, and um, for giving us things that we can discuss and Hopefully, for those who are watching, uh, you know, when they find it uh, on YouTube, which is where it'll be, um, they, they will also gain something from listening to your wisdom and the discussions that we've had. So thanks very much for your input. Uh, we'll be having another show next week, and it'd be great to welcome you back. And um, Thanks, David. Okay. All right. Have a good, have a good evening, James. Nice to meet you, James. Thanks. Thank you. Steve. And you, David. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye, folks.